Alan Turing is one of the most fascinating and brilliant figures in the whole history of mathematics and computing. Let's have a look at what he achieved. everyone, welcome to Attic Philosophy. On this channel, we're discussing all areas of philosophy from abstract metaphysics and logic to applied social issues. In this video, I'm going to go over Alan Turing, his life and what he managed to achieve both for logic, mathematics and the theory of computing. If you're finding these videos interesting, why don't you consider subscribing to the channel? I'd really appreciate it. Hit the bell icon to get updates. Today, I'm going to be telling you about Alan Turing, what he did and how he basically invented theoretical computer science. OK, so let's start off with a little bit about Turing's life. He was born in London in 1912. He went to boarding school, Sherborne, and then he studied maths at King's College, Cambridge. He was recognised as a really gifted mathematics student from an early age. In 1935, he was elected as a fellow of King's College. And in 1936, he wrote one of the seminal papers of 20th century mathematics. It's called on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidung's problem. OK, so I'm going to be telling you a lot about that paper later on, so I'll explain it a little bit later. In 1936, he moves to the US to study with Alonzo Church. So if you go on and study theoretical computer science, you are going to be hearing a lot about Alonzo Church. You're going to hear about type theory, the lambda calculus. That was all down to him. So Turing and Church working together in these years, you basically have a lot of the early days of computer science right there. He gets his PhD from Princeton. He comes back to the UK and he starts working for the Government Code and Cipher School. When war kicks off in 1939, he moves to Bletchley Park to start working as a codebreaker. He designs the bomb computer and this is built and it's put to work in cracking German Enigma codes. Now that work, they were often frustrated because they never had enough people or money or machines to be able to keep up with all the German codes that were coming in. So in 1941, he wrote to Churchill saying, basically, look, if you give us a little bit of money, we can save loads of lives. And to Churchill's credit, he gave them the money and they built more machines and they saved an awful lot of lives. It's sometimes estimated that Turing and the work that his collaborators did in Bletchley Park during the war shortened the war by a couple of years and saved hundreds of thousands of lives. OK, that's not a bad achievement in anyone's books. After the war, Turing devotes himself to theoretical computers full time. So he's working on the automatic computing engine, this idea that you have a computer that can store its own program. He's awarded the OBE and he moves to Manchester in 1948 to be part of their computing laboratory. He works on the Manchester Mark I. He's basically doing software for it. And in 1950, he publishes a paper in mind. It's basically a philosophy paper where he describes ideas about artificial intelligence and he proposes the Turing test. This idea of, well, how do we actually tell whether a computer is intelligent or not? And his idea is, well, we basically do a blind test. We have a human and a computer and they're having discussions. And if you can't tell whether it's a human or a computer that you're talking to, we should count that computer as being intelligent. That's a controversial idea, but it's still very influential in artificial intelligence. He's made a fellow of the Royal Society. And then in 1951, he starts working on mathematical biology. Only a year later, he publishes The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. Now, I don't really know what that is, but it's got something to do with the way that patterns and shapes develop in biological entities. So it's like, you know, stripes and spots on tigers and things like that. OK. And Turing's idea was that you can use mathematics, differential equations to predict and explain why and how that happens. And this is this is recognized as a classic in the field. Pretty incredible that this young guy can contribute in such a short space of time to logic, abstract mathematics, theoretical computer science and mathematical biology. But it's not really a happy story to the end of his life. Only a year later, in 1952, he's put on trial for homosexuality, which was still illegal in the UK. He was convicted. And rather than going to jail, he accepts probation and a, a, a programme of chemical castration, which 
sounds really, really horrible. Uh, he was banned from the USA. His security clearance was revoked. And two years later, 1954, he dies at the age of 41. He died from cyanide poisoning. It was suspected suicide. That's disputed. Some people think that it was a genuine accident because he was doing lots of experiments in his house that would have involved cyanide being around. Other people think that he put those experiments there so that there was deniability from his relatives if it was suicide. These are the things that you just never know. So I just want to pause here and think about the huge cost that discrimination around at the time had on this person's life. And imagine the things that he could have done in the second half of his life, age 41 onwards, and the things he would have seen. He would have seen his work in computing develop into what we have nowadays, the internet, computers that allow us to talk to each other right around the world. Discrimination had a terrible impact on him and a huge number of people's lives. In 2009, the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown, he offers an official apology. And a couple of years later, in 2013, the Queen offers a pardon for Alan Turing. And then a few years after that, 2017, we get Alan Turing Law. OK, this is the kind of colloquial name for this law that offered a retrospective pardon for everyone everyone that was prosecuted under um, the law against homosexuality. It's estimated there's about 75,000 men that were persecuted under that law. So there we have a really brief overview of Alan Turing's life and what he accomplished. I'm going to follow this up with two more videos. In one, I'm going to go into detail and look at how he used Turing machines to prove the undecidability of first order logic. And then in another follow up video, I'm going to go into more detail on Turing machines, what they are, how they work and the developments there have been over the years since Turing's time. So I hope you found this interesting. If you've got any comments or questions, leave me a comment below. I really appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>